open your Bibles this morning to the book of Matthew, and this morning we will continue in our series uh, through the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, for those who are visiting with us, uh, we have been going through the Sermon on the Mount as we uh, want to preach through books of the Bible and, and passages. Uh, we are a Bible-believing church, and we feel like that is how the Lord would have us deal with His Word. So we will continue in chapter 6 today and verse number 1. So if you would go ahead and open your Bibles to that, Matthew chapter 6 and verse number 1. I'm going to go ahead and read the whole passage to you, but I'm probably just going to preach on the first verse um, so that we are able to set the stage, if you would, uh, kind of set the, the launch pad for what's going to happen in the next three uh, sections of teaching. So in order to do that, I have to kind of uh, go back to chapter 5, and we have to summarize that and then set the launch pad for chapter 6, and then next Sunday, we'll hit chapter 6 hard. You ready? Matthew chapter 6, verses 1 through 8. Beware of practicing your righteousness before other people in order to be seen by them, for then you will have no reward from your Father who is in heaven. Thus, when you give to the needy, sound no trumpet before you, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, that they may be praised by others. Truly I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that your giving may be in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you. And then, sorry, and when you pray, you must not be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and at the street corners that they may be seen by others. Truly, I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you pray, go into your room and shut the door and pray to your Father who is in secret. And your Father who sees in secret will reward you. And when you pray, do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do, for they think that they will be heard for their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask Him. Pray then like this, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For if you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive you your trespasses. And when you fast, do not look gloomy like the hypocrites. For they disfigure their faces, that their fasting may be seen by others. Truly, I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you fast, anoint your head and wash your face, that your fasting may not be seen by others, but by your Father who is in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you. Now, let's go back to the context of this passage. We're in the Sermon on the Mount. This is where Jesus is on the mountainside. It's not any special mountain. It's just a mountainside. And a mountain became the mountain because the teacher was standing upon it. And so he's standing and he's teaching and he's pulling his disciples to him and he's speaking to the disciples. There are many others that are there. And we know for a fact that the scribes and the Sadducees and the Pharisees have also drawn near. And he is speaking and he is giving the principles for kingdom living. There have been those that have said that this is only a list of ethical conduct to be uh, given for everyone to act accordingly. Uh, I would proposed to you this morning that it is not just a list of ethical conduct because this conduct that is spoken of here is absolutely impossible for the man without the Spirit of God to accomplish. These are basic principles that will flow from one who has been indwelt 
by the Holy Spirit. And so these are principles for kingdom living by the citizens of the kingdom. Those that have trusted the Lord Jesus Christ and have placed their full trust in Him and hence have been born again. So the context is the Sermon on the Mount. And we find this contrasting going on in chapter 5 and 6. And the contrasting is the kingdom principles versus the righteousness, the righteous thoughts, attitudes, teachings, and now today we start with the righteous acts of the scribes and the Pharisees. Is a contrasting. Jesus starts off in saying this, lest your righteousness exceed that of the scribes and the Pharisees, you will not enter the kingdom of God. And at the end of chapter five, he's gonna end up in saying, be perfect as your heavenly father is perfect. And so he's really going to now re-emphasize and even elevate some things as he challenges us toward kingdom living. So here is a summary of chapter number five. Chapter five, verses one through 12, deals with the Beatitudes. Here they are. I'll do them very quickly for you because you need to know these if you're going to fulfill anything that he speaks about. Blessed are those who are poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. This is the understanding of a spiritual poverty, a spiritual bankruptcy, that we have absolutely nothing. Therefore, blessed are those who, who mourn, for they shall be comforted. This is a mourning or a spiritual brokenness because of a spiritual bankruptcy. Blessed are those who are meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Not weak, but meek. It's speaking of a spiritual submission. Jesus was meek in the sense of submitted to the Father's will. And so blessed are those who are spiritually submitted. Verse number six, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness sake, for they shall be satisfied. If we understand that we are spiritually bankrupt, therefore we become spiritually broken, therefore we are spiritually submitted, we will hunger and thirst for his righteousness. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Because we've received mercy, we will give mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Speaks of again a submittedness and a desire of dealing with the motive of the heart. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the sons of God. I heard a man preach this morning, and he said the peacemakers are those that I have been fighting in the military. He got it completely wrong. The peacemakers are those that are making peace between God and man, doing the work of reconciliation. Uh, we have been entrusted with the work of reconciliation, the ministry of reconciliation, that it, on Christ's behalf, we say to men to be reconciled to God. And it's also living at peace with one another. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad for your reward, and I want you to underline this word in your mind this morning, your reward is great in heaven for you, for so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Reward in heaven, and I'm gonna get there in a minute. Then verses 13 through 16, after you have these beatitudes, you understand that that is what comes at the time of, of salvation. Now verses 13 through 16 deal directly with the role that we play. We are to be the salt and the light, salt that, salt that preserves, salt that penetrates. Uh, we are the salt and we are the light, light that dispels the darkness. And then in verses 17 through 19, Jesus said that he is the fulfillment of the law. And he said he did not come to abolish the law, but he came to fulfill it. Then in verses 20, he makes a challenge. Lest your righteousness exceed that of the Pharisees and that of the scribes, you will not enter the kingdom of God. Then verses five, sorry, verse, chapter five, verses 21 through 47, he now gives six of those teachings of the scribes and the Pharisees. He just chooses six, and he's gonna say, you've heard it said, but I say to you, and here they are, he speaks about anger. You've heard it said, do not commit murder, but I say to you, if you, look, if you are angry with your brother, you've committed murder in the heart. 
He says this, you've heard it said, do not commit adultery, but I say to you, if you've looked at lust upon a woman, you have committed adultery in your heart. He then speaks on divorce. Then he goes on and speaks on oaths. And then he spoke about retaliation, how we should not retaliate. And then lastly, he would speak about loving our enemies and praying for those that persecute us. And then in Matthew 5, 48, the last verse, he ups the ante and he says this, you must be perfect as your heavenly father is perfect. Did you get all of that? You write every word down I just spoke. So that is, a, that is a summary of chapter five. In chapter number five, we find uh, that there's the in emphasizing of the, the inner moral righteousness. Where now when we get to chapter six, there's gonna be the emphasizing of the outward moral righteousness. In chapter five, is speaking about attitudes and thoughts. When we get to chapter six, it's now gonna be about action. The outward, that which people can see. You see, for many times we can fool people by putting on a mask. We can fool people by, by acting as if we've got it, but God sees the heart. And so in chapter five, he's dealt with the heart. You've heard it said, do not commit adultery. I say, if you've looked upon a woman. You've heard it said, do not murder. I say, if you're angry. And so he's now dealing not with an outward, but with an inward. Now in chapter six, he's going to turn the tables and say, all right, we've spoken about the heart. We've spoken about an inner moral uh, righteousness, but now let's speak about an outward formal righteousness, that which people are going to see, the works that you're going to do. Because naturally, if you're saved, if you've trusted Christ as your Savior, there's going to be an outward show. There's, go there's going to be an outward fruit. There's going to be acts of righteousness. We're going to pray. We're going to give. We're going to fast. We're going to do these things because that's what we're instructed to do. And this is something that we are enabled to do by the Spirit of God. And so MacArthur in his commentary says that chapter 5, 21 through 48 focuses on the teaching of the law. In other words, what men believe. Whereas chapter 6 verses 1 through 18 focuses on the practice of the law. In other words, what men do. So he's going to give us three different things, three different spiritual disciplines. And you'll notice this word is always used. And when you give and when you pray and when you fast. Not if you pray, if you give and if you fast, but when. In other words, Jesus is taking it for granted that the, the citizens of the kingdom of heaven are going to pray. They are going to give and they are going to fast. These are the spiritual disciplines that he's going to deal with. He's going to deal with giving, praying, and fasting. In this three, giving deals with uh, our acts towards other people. Praying, our act toward God. Fasting, our act toward ourselves. These are the three facets. Praying, God giving others fasting self. So we're gonna see that. So let me start with making a very strong clarification because of what I'm about to teach. I believe wholeheartedly, without a bit of doubt, that salvation comes through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and by the grace of God only. There's absolutely nothing that you can do to earn your salvation. You can tithe, you can pray, and you can give to others, you can fast, and you will not go to heaven. You will do those things if you're saved, but there are many that think that, that by their works they can be saved. I just have to attend church. I've got to be a deacon. I've got to teach in a Sunday school class. I've got to tithe. Uh, I've even had one man who came here on a Sunday before having to leave to go all the way back up north. He came in for 10 minutes of a Sunday school class, and then he left, and he said, I'm, I'm just in and out. And I said, are you in a hurry? Are you okay? Is there something I can help you with? He said, no, in all my time, I've never missed the Sunday school class. So while I'm on vacation, I at least want to continue what I've never missed. And I was thinking to myself, my goodness, you come in for 10 minutes. I hope you're putting down that as a quarter of a class and not a full class. But there are those that are so ritualistic 
that they believe they've got to do these actions or else God will not love them or do these actions and they will be able to deserve their salvation. Where we understand that salvation is by faith only. Let me clarify that one more time. Salvation is a gift of God, not by works. It is the undeserved merit of God placed upon people that he has chosen and this is through Jesus Christ only. However, does not negate everything I've just said. The Bible also speaks of rewards. The Bible also speaks of rewards. Let me back up. Clarification. Salvation is not a reward. Salvation is by the grace of God. But God in His grace has set it out in such a way that He does reward people for what they will do here on this earth. And that's what I want to deal with in these verses because that is the recurring theme. Chapter 5, that verse, remember I said, underline this in your mind. Verse 12, rejoice and be glad for your reward reward is great in heaven. Now go with me to chapter number 6 and we will now today begin unpacking chapter 6. And today I'm purely going to speak about the idea of the reality of rewards the reality of rewards. I'm going to skip and jump. Would you do that with me? As you look in your Bibles, if you don't have a Bible, grab yourself one. They're under the chairs or look up on the screens. It's good to have it in your hand. Here we go. Verse one, beware of practicing your righteousness before other men in order to be seen by them for then you will have no reward from your Father who is in heaven. Verse 1 sets up everything for verses 2 through verse 18. Verse number, th- number 2. I'm just going to grab words, okay? Do it with me. Truly, I say to you at the end of verse 2, they have received their reward. Verse 3 But when you give to needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that your giving may be in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you. Verse number five. Now we're speaking about praying. And those hypocrites who love to stand and pray in the synagogues at street corners, that they may be seen by others. Truly I say to you, they have received their reward. Look at verse number six. But when you pray, go into your room and shut the door and pray to your father who is in secret and your father who sees in secret will reward you. Do you see the word reward? It's recurring all the way through. Now drop your eyes all the way down to verse number 16. And when you fast, do not look gloomy like the hypocrites for they disfigure their faces that their fasting may be seen by others. Truly I say to you, they have received their reward. Verse seven, verse number 18. He says that your fasting may not be seen by others, but your father who is in secret and your father who sees in secret will reward you. Do you see the recurring word rewards? The reality of rewards is first and foremost this, that rewards are always given. Rewards are always given. Uh, Whether it be given from the world or whether it be given from God, rewards will be given. Uh, In the sense of the world, uh, the idea is being paid a wage for what we've done, to be paid in full. Uh, This is the payment of recognition. Uh, This is where we are recognized by people, where we are patted on the back, and many times those ones that will slap you on your back is no more than back-slapping fools who are trying to flatter you. But they're paying you a reward. I'm not saying we shouldn't be thankful and encourage one another. I think it more has to do with the motive of the person doing the action. If we are doing this for a reward uh, that we will receive from men, for recognition of men, or to be elevated in the sight of man, that reward will be given to you, but that will be your reward. There's two different words used here. This blew my mind. I jumped on the phone last night. I called a friend. It was like, kind of this millionaire thing, you know, you want to call a friend? I jumped on the phone. I called my best friend. I said, did you see this? And he said, what? I said, there's two different words used for rewards in this passage. And he's like, no, 
really? I, maybe I was like excited about nothing and, and I want to share that with you. Notice every time that reward is spoken about you receiving your reward from the world, uh, the, the, the Greek word that is used is this word mistos. And mistos means this, it means to earn a wage in full the payment of recognition. And this is what he's saying. If you want to give to the needy, you need to do that. But if you do that by blowing a trumpet for everybody to see, then you have received your mistos, your earned payment in full, the payment of recognition. In other words, there's no more reward to get. You got it in full. It's a full payment, mistos is used. But then, not only is rewards given by the world, but rewards are also given by God. But that's where the different word was used. Every time it speaks of your reward from your father, your, your father who sees in secret will reward you. Further on, he says things like, and your father who sees in secret again will reward you. Further down, verse number 18, and your father who sees in secret will reward you. It's a totally different word for reward. And it is this, apodidomi. Apodidomi is the word used. So in the English, we have reward and reward, but it's mistos and apodidomi. It's two different words. I'm the only one excited about this. But it's amazing that God in his wisdom uses two different words. Why? Because mistos means payment in full, the payment of recognition, where apodidomi means this, the gift of honor. Isn't that cool? Isn't that just so cool? Either you can work for man and get your payment in full right now, or you can work for your Father who is in heaven, and one day, one day you will receive the gift of honor, that he will honor you. This is what James spoke about when he says those that humble themselves in due time, he will lift you up. Friends, this is so exciting because I know this, that my God will give me an open payment, the gift of honor. But at the same time, I'm a little discouraged because I live with something that many of you live with. It's called the fear of man. What will people say? And wanting other people's approval. But the Bible's very clear that God is a God of rewards. Listen to this. James 4.10, humble yourselves before the Lord and he will exalt you. Second Corinthians chapter five and verse 10 says, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. Who's the we? Uh, the we is believers. Which judgment seat is this? This is not the great white throne at the end when people will be cast into the, the, the lake of fire, which is the second death. No, no, this is the beamer seat of Christ. This is the seat of judgment on rewards or lack thereof. This is that judgment seat that is in heaven. When you die and you go to see before the Lord, you will be judged for your works on this earth. And either you will get rewarded or there will be lack of reward. Again, it's not salvation. Remember, salvation is not a reward. The fact that you're standing at this specific judgment seat where Christ will judge you is because you're saved. This is the master standing before his servants. Second Corinthians 5.10, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. For what purpose? So that each one may receive what is due for what he has done in the body, whether it be good or evil. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 12 through 15, the Apostle Paul again writing to the church in Corinth, saying, Now if anyone builds on the foundation with gold, silver, precious stone, wood, hay, straw. Now we know the foundation is Christ, and he's speaking about works done for the kingdom of God. Each one's work will become manifest for the day will disclose it. Not the day as in sunlight, it's a capital D. It's a, it's a day, the day, the day of judgment the day of judgment will disclose it because it will be revealed by fire and the fire will test what sort of work each one has done. If the work that anyone has built on the foundation survives, he will receive a reward. 
If anyone's work is burnt up, he will suffer loss, though he himself will be saved, but only as through the fire. Hebrews 11 and the end of verse 6 says, we need to believe that he exists and he rewards those who seek him. God is a God of rewards. Why? Because we deserve it. No, because God is a God of grace. And so it is appointed unto man once to die and then the judgment. And the judgment will either be a judgment of condemnation for those that have not trusted Christ or a judgment through the blood of Christ. And we will then be judged accordingly for rewards. The Bible speaks of crowns that we will be given on that day, rewards. And in Revelation, it speaks of how we will take those rewards or those crowns and we will lay them at the feet of him because it's all about him. It was never about, about us. Our motivation was never to get the reward. It was always about him. So rewards are given, but secondly, the reality of rewards say this, rewards can be forfeited. The rewards of heaven can be forfeited. How? Well, I think one way is through inactivity. Inactivity. And these are believers that know the good they should do and do it not, and they will not receive the rewards. And they know God has planned for them. He's given them gifts. And this is, this is the story of, uh, th that Jesus told about the, the servants with the talents. He gave one five and the other two and the other one talent. And he came and, and they had given talents back in proportion. You've received talents in the sense of spiritual gifting. You've received special opportunities to touch people for Christ. You have received uh, influence that you can have over people. You've been entrusted with the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And you can forfeit the rewards of using those by being inactive. One lady said to me, I've learned the, new, the, the best saying that I need to learn to say every time I'm asked to serve in the church. Say no and let others grow. And I reeled back. And I said, sister, I don't want to give anybody my reward. I'm saying yes, that my Christ may be exalted. A sign of saying no, that others grow, says this, I don't care. Let somebody else do it. So you can forfeit your rewards through being inactive. And I'm not talking about forfeiting your salvation. I'm just making that clarification again, just so no one leaves here, saying Anton says you can lose your salvation. Salvation's not the reward, but in heaven there will be rewards for the saved. And those saved that are truly saved can forfeit their rewards by not doing what God's called them to do. Are you being obedient to what God's called you to? Are you doing what God's called you to do? Are you serving in the areas that God has called you to? Are you using what God has entrusted to you, your talents, your treasures, your time? Are you using that for God? You can forfeit the reward but we can also forfeit our rewards through serving with the wrong motives. This speaks of personal pride and the desire of recognition. This is called the wave offering. When the plate comes by, everybody should see. This is, well, preacher, I will give to the church but do you think we could put a plaque? We had a plaque on here, by the way, when I arrived at this church. It's gone. Did you see it's gone? Just put my, my name on it. Just so people can remember. That stained glass window, I paid for that. Oh, let, let us move into the, the Roos wing of the new building because he was the pastor who was here. God forbid it that anyone should be exalted but Christ. You see, you can forfeit your rewards by giving out of the wrong motives. Instead of it being Christ exalted, it's about personal recognition. It's about personal pride. It's all about me. 
And that's why when Jesus is saying, when you pray, rather go into your closet. Well, he says, well, when you give, don't let your left hand know what your right hand's doing. I'll tell you, I was saving this for next week, but I'll tell you right now. <laughs> no, I will not. My wife is looking at me and she's like, he's going to preach on giving, isn't he? I'm about to, but that's right. So I never knew this. And, and one of my, my heroes in the faith is Charles Spurgeon. He is, is one of my greatest heroes in the faith. And Spurgeon, I didn't know this about his wife. And so I, I learned this this past couple of weeks as I was studying. Mrs. Spurgeon used to sell the eggs of her chickens. Did anyone know that? You did? Well, you knew more than me, brother. You need to be preaching here this morning. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Uh, um, she sold the eggs. And it wouldn't matter whether it was someone in the town or whether it was a family member, whoever it was, she would sell the eggs. And everyone said, Mrs. Spurgeon is a miser, that the Spurgeons are wanting money. So that's why they'll not even give an egg away. I mean, her chickens are laying crazy amounts of eggs and she's selling them. She's not willing to give them away. They just want money. The Spurgeons, boy, they're a greedy bunch. And then when Mrs. Spurgeon died, the truth was revealed. The eggs that she was selling, she was taking that money and they were supporting two widows in their town with the egg money. But they believed not to let the left hand know what the right hand is doing and so forfeit their rewards. Do you imagine this? Sure. I gotta charge you for the eggs because you know, we're looking after these. We are looking after. That I say, we are looking after these people. You see the difference in motive? You can forfeit your rewards by wrong motives. Let us be certain our motives are true. It was William Barclay that said this. It would be a sadly short-sighted creature who grasped the rewards of time and let the rewards of eternity go. It would be a sadly short-sighted creature who grasped the rewards of time and let the rewards of eternity go. So here is a challenge of application. How can I do this? I think the Apostle Paul hit it right on the head. And Jesus too. Colossians 3.17, whatever you do, in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. And Paul said in 1 Corinthians 10, 31, so whether you eat or you drink, whatever you do, do it all to the glory of God. That's an application. Let us become resolute in saying, God, may you be glorified. There's not place for two it's a one seater. It's a one seater. Isaiah, God tells us, the heavens, my throne, and the earth is my footstool. May we never seek to be seated on the throne and receive the glory that is due him alone. So in conclusion, Matthew chapter 6, verse 19 through 21 is a good summary do not lay up for yourself treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. Lake Lord Baptist Church, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Let us pray. As your heads are bowed, and I'm going to give you an opportunity this morning. This altar's open. Do you exist for the glory of God? I know you do exist for His glory, but do you live for His glory only? Do you live with the fear of man, always desirous of His recognition, always afraid of what man's going to say? Is today the day that you say, you know what, Lord, I'm just going to lay myself down before you again. I, I humble myself before you because I look forward to that day when you will exalt me. Not because I deserve it, 
but just because you're a God of grace. I want to stand up straight in that day of judgment in knowing that I have done my best. I've run the race and I fought the good fight. I've kept the faith. Can you say that? Are you living for His glory? Friend, I want to encourage you. Great is your reward in heaven because our God who is in secret rewards that which is done in secret. This altar is open if you'd like to pray here. If you'd like to pray in your seat, you do that too. I'd hate to close out the service without giving you an opportunity to respond to our God. And then we'll close out in a word of prayer. We'll bless the food and we'll dismiss into the fellowship area. We will enjoy a meal together this afternoon. This altar is open. You come pray. Father, we are thankful for the time we've had today. We're thankful for the fact that you love us so much. Not only have you saved us, but God, you've even decided to lavish upon us the gift of honor, a reward for that which you do, you enable us to do. I mean, it's beyond my understanding that you would want to reward us for what you do. So Lord, help us to be your willing vessels, just those clay vessels always seeking to be empowered by you and desirous to do just what you've called us to. Lord, I thank you for each one that's here. I know that you have a purpose for each one. Lord, I pray that your will be done in their lives. Lord, that you would energize them and invigor them that they might be zealous for your kingdom. God, those that are giving themselves so fully to your work, I pray that you would strengthen them, that they may continue on, continue steadfastly, giving themselves fully to your work because we know that our work in you is not in vain. So help us to live for you, Jesus. Lord, as we now go and spend time around the table, fellowshipping around a meal, I pray that our conversation would be pleasing to you, just seasoned with grace. And God, may our fellowship be a outworking of that which you have already done for us to allow that fellowship to take place. We thank you for the food, for you've provided that for us today. We pray that you would bless it. 
use it for the nourishment of our bodies. We just praise you, Jesus, because of who you are and what you've done. Help us to be fully sold out, recklessly abandoned to you. This I pray in Jesus' name.